Um, Lucinda, where I thought we could start this morning, um, well, first of all, I want to say that we're here with Lucinda Corn, and today is November 7th, 2002. And where I wanted to start this morning is to ask you about your candy making. <laughs> well, that's kind of a hobby. Mm -hmm. And like I say, everything I know about it, I uh, think I learned from my sister, but I don't do anything very well. So we just slap it together. What kinds of candies do you make? Oh, I make turtles. That's Bob's favorite. He say, claims he doesn't like chocolate, but he still likes turtles. And uh, with that, of course, I make caramels to go in the turtles. That's one of the basics. And van vanilla cream centers. There's a French uh, center that I like really, really very much, but with my hands the way they are, I can't make them anymore. So I don't try to to do those. They're very hard to you see. You make a, a cream center, and you uh, add whatever you want. Nuts or coconut. I use a lot of coconut in my vanilla cream center. I probably the best cookbook I have ever seen on candy is Pope's, and it was published in, must have been the 50s, maybe even the 40s, and it isn't in print now, at least I haven't been able to get it. The last one I bought, I think I ordered in Spice when they were still in Elgin, <laughs> so that's, that's a long time ago. Uh, I don't know what else. I. Uh, I learned a few things from him, and I, I don't dip very well. I don't do anything very well, but I make boxes of candy. Christmas, I've got a group coming in next week. Well, three or four, that's enough in the kitchen. Uh, and I'm going to show them how, because I usually make them for the ladies' aid at Christmas time, and they were asking about it. So we're going to start then. This is a little early to start, but uh, you don't want to leave them too long. But I've got a good room in there for candy. <laughs> That's always cold this time of year. That's the, which room is that? That e e West room. The, the sitting parlor? Yeah, we aren't, don't use it for anything else. And, Everybody complains when you open the door to put something in, but uh, it's a good place to. You don't have to take a lot of refrigerator space and so on. And of course, they make fudge and nougats and simple things that you just cook one day and eat it that day. <laughs> Well, it's so good. And we, you had also been talking about the, the marble slab that from the courthouse, and you used that in candy making. Could you tell us about that? Also? Yes, I use that for kneading. I use it for fudge now. Well, I think I always have. I never was quite sure, even with the thermometer, whether I got the temperature right with fudge. And it's very important to have it right keep it soft. And uh, I uh, find the marble slab works nicely. You, you, uh, you use a scraper and scrape it up. Just knead it for about 10 minutes. It's the same principle as kneading bread, only you just use a scraper and, and uh, a knife. If I try to make two or three kinds of filling for creams, I, I could do it, used to be able to do that. I don't do that anymore. I try to limit the time I have to hand, spend because everything I do is slower. Mm -hmm. And it will continue, I suppose, to 
be slower till I stop. <laughs> <laughs> Where did that slab come from? Where did the marble come from? I have no idea. I. Uh, well, no, I, you said it, it came from somewhere here in the county? Oh, it came from the courthouse. Uh, I, I thought you meant where it came from. Uh, where does marble come from? Uh, I think they, a, a lot of marble is Italian marble. They have quarries in Italy where they um, uh, cut it out from. You think a lot comes from Italy? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Also the Northeast, like Vermont. They, they say Vermont? Vermont. Yeah. I, uh, the only thing I know about it, we have a, one of these, like like the cake you were talking about, tears that you put uh, in the cemetery for my my family, and it came from Scotland. Now, I don't know anything of, of the history except it. Could, could, could we get rid of that piece of paper? Actually, I'm hearing that sound. Thank you. <laughs> oh. I can hear a little, it sounds like a little mouse. I'm not sure what's going to happen. <laughs> Okay, I'm sorry. So the the marble piece came from the courthouse. They were um, uh, doing something over. I don't exactly know what, but they had these big marble slabs, and you saw how big it is. It doesn't quite reach the edges, and, and it's not very handy. It's handy for cooking. Don't put your china on it. <laughs> it breaks easily, or the china breaks easily. But if you uh, use the slab for kneading and making pies, it's, it's good for that. So it has lots of uses. And you just put it, um, a lot of kitchens are putting it in. In the, uh, I think my daughter said she had one. They had built the house recently, and, mm -hmm. and so uh, I guess other people have found that it works. Uh, you always see these marble top tables in the living room or something that I couldn't quite see making fudge and kneading <laughs> on the, in the living room, uh, although I might be tempted at this point. <laughs> That's, a, that's all I know about it. Okay. Um, I also wanted to ask if you could tell us again. I mean, we were talking last time a little bit about how the house got built. Uh huh. And <clears throat> I was wondering if you could tell us that story again. And um, starting with uh, uh, relating the year that the, this house was built in. Well, it was built in 1850. That is, he started it in 1850, and he fin finished it in 1854. And the ex exterior is uh, all the same, really, except for the porch, which was added on in 1925. Now, that's the outside I'm talking about, in appearance. It really, you can see in the, the pictures I showed you. That one uh, is much like the 20th century. Wait a minute, was that? Yeah, I guess it was still the 20th century when that was made, but two or three years ago. Well, no, 20 years ago, because we gave it to Bob. Uh, anyway, I'm not sure. Well, how, how did he make the bricks? Well, they had a kiln. And I suppose, because I've never seen any evidence of it around here, but they had a kiln that was brought in, and uh, they made the the bricks just the way they're... I don't know. I don't have the recipe for it. <laughs> Maybe you do. But I think it takes a certain amount of iron to get a good red brick. And Grandfather... Uh, Corn was not at all happy with the first bricks that they made. They used the slough 
area, which is over, uh, well, near the fence line. There are lots of slew areas, but that one was the one that he used. And I think he thought, well, it was covered with trees and probably a lot of undergrowth uh, where they could use it. I don't know how much. He said, a gramophone told me that they made 100,000 bricks before they laid any. But when they started laying them, they found that these were kind of uh, mud colored there you may have seen them in various houses and uh, he didn't like the color of them so they went over in back of the big barn and used that field I often feel sorry for the people who had to count the bricks <laughs> we had a friend who came here uh, one of Sally's friends from Oregon came and he counted the, bri the bricks uh, in the north end. And now I can't remember, and he can't remember either how many he counted. <laughs> but it, he actually did it mathematically like you would, but he couldn't even remember what he, he had said. And I didn't write it down. So he didn't think it was that important, but now I'm curious. <laughs> Uh, that's what happens to you when you get involved in things like that. The house itself is interesting. Um, I, they did not build the house all at once. They kind of did it in sta they built it in stages. I, as far as I can tell, I would say they must have built the skeleton. They. The east wing and the west wing do not have basements under them. And the kitchen didn't until, um, I think Bob was in high school, in the 20s. He and the hired man dug out these, what they called, in my day, uh, bigger. The big stones were the foundation, and they brought out these two big stones. That was one of our favorite stories because when we moved up here, Dave was only four and the other kids were a little bit older, but we had a lot of toys. And uh, Grandma had used the one room in the basement for fruit, so we took the fruit out. Well, the fruit was pretty well gone, but we took out everything there. But we tried to move these stones. Nigger heads is the term they used back in those days. Uh, but if they, uh, it, they couldn't get them through some of the doors because they're too big to go through the doors. So they have to go the long way around. So the story was that if we didn't have anything else to do that day, the men would work on that. <laughs> the, moving the stones from about the same time we had to put a new furnace in. <laughs> so there were all those things to do. And there's still th things that we aren't doing, but wish we could. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted you to tell us a little about, well, well bef uh, another question about the house. Did they hire a mason to help lay the bricks? Do you know about that? I have no idea about that. I, I mm -hmm. have no training. I wish I had brought the paper. When you see the prices, for, I've got it somewhere, but did, I'd have did, to Did um, Mr. Did Robert Corrin, did Great Grandpa Robert Corrin keep a, a record of what he spent on things? Yeah, yeah, I have a lot of, uh, several account books. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very interesting because in the 1940s, uh, I think they were paying $4 for 100 pounds of beef or something like that. And it's, it's just kind of an amazing. I believe they bought six chickens 
for twenty dollars. They probably didn't buy them all at once. No, it was, it was less than that. I I meant to to say that because it it, it is important. I saved it, but uh, maybe we could right pull, now we, now I can't. We could pull that out sometime and take a closer look at that. That would be very yeah, interesting. Yeah, it, it's a uh, and labor and like a dollar a day for a team. Uh, it it was uh, a different time. Um, something else I wanted to ask you was uh, if you could tell us about the Koran Church, what the story is to the church. Well, it was a neighborhood church, and it it was very close to our line, and the. Uh, the Plato Township line, and I I showed you the picture, and I have the of the paper I found in the in amongst the letters from the Civil War, and it didn't I show you that picture? I'm, I'm not sure I've seen that one. Mm. Bob, yeah. did you get that picture? Of the the uh, Hampton Plato Fifteenth Caval Cavalry. Oh, the oh the list. All the ladies did, did this list of where all the the different battles they fought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that oh, is. you know what I mean. Yeah. Where is it? It's in back of the bed in the uh, my room there. The head. You you put things <laughs> wherever. I have a lot of big, uh, not a lot, but a few big atlases. And I don't know if you're familiar with the 1871 atlas. Of, I've seen reprints of that. Well, the reprints are so nice and handy. But here's this big. Mine was my grandfather's, and it has just gone to pieces. But that is one of the things that I think we ought to send to a museum. But uh, I love these Pea Ridge. <laughs> and he, I think in one of these letters he. But it it looks like they might have used some of this lettering that they used for bags and things like that back in I'm sure in, at Garfield you've seen a lot of that sort of thing. Otherwise, I I don't know. It's a kind of a a parchment, and it was all folded as you can see and when it was in this box of letters and. Um, I pulled it out. I think I had just found it, and Eve was here one time, Larry, uh, Jerry's mother-in-law, and she said, "Oh, you should take care of that. You should straighten it out." <laughs> well, I we have lots of old picture frames. One thing about the family, they did ta have a lot of pictures taken. I mean, pictures of the of the. Uh, senior members of the family. Anyway, uh, uh, that's that's why it's framed, because Eve told me to. Uh, I didn't know anything about it. And I just knew it was interesting. and uh, But I think it's very defi definitely made. You see, it's the uh, Plato and Campton. I think the church at that time was uh, not here. It was, um, I think they worshipped in the, what they call the Stone Schoolhouse, which is a little bit east of Cor on Corn Road, on, not on Corn Road, on Silver Glen Road, east of Corn, about a half mile. And that, I think that was 
the I think the stone part, it wasn't a stone building, as I understand it. It was a, the name of the family who lived there. But I had to get an atlas to find that out. Anyway, uh, I'm di digressing, but I don't, <laughs> don't know exactly where you want me to stop. Because um, it was not unusual in the 1840s when, when um, people were just getting settled in this area that initially they were worshiping in schoolhouses. Schoolhouses, we have first homes, yeah. log cabins, and yeah. then they would go on to possibly schoolhouses. Uh, actually, the Methodist church in Plato was, well, later they built this one here as a, a branch of it. And then there was another one uh, on, uh, in East Burlington. And there were th the three churches, and they always got somebody from Garrett Seminary as, as the pastor. He'd go from these churches. And when they come out on, on the train. So it was early in the 20th century, I think, when, when uh, they had these churches. Well, then when cars came in, people could go to the denomination they wanted to, and um, the poor little country churches, many of them closed up, just as the corn church did, I think. I think some of the material from the corn church went to uh, South Elgin Methodist Church, and the Burlington, I suppose, East Burlington, probably a lot of it went to the Burlington Church. I'm, I don't know all those things, I'm guessing, but uh, that's pretty much the way it happened. But my mother-in-law, who was born in the late 80s, I'm, I'm not sure exactly, but anyway, she said that she was confirmed in the uh, Plato Church but it was a Lutheran service. The Methodist Church in, in Plato was the only one in Plato of that nature. But at, the, at that time, apparently, they were still sharing buildings. And that, that would be, as I say, in the, almost the beginning of the century. And then when the railroads came in, that made so much a difference. If you're interested um, in railroads, and if you're interested in roads, they make such a difference. Now, uh, for example, Wasco wasn't there until the railroad went through in the late 90s. Plato was there, but they moved the town down <laughs> to meet the railroad. But where the cemetery is, it, if you know Plato at all, it, the cemetery is, the church now is across from it. It used to be a part of the, the uh, place. The church there was built in 1859. So, um, as I say, Railroads did make a lot of difference. Most of the back, what we call the back towns in Kane County, you know what I mean by back towns, um, away from the river, and uh, most of them were, uh, might have different denominations, but they, in horse and buggy, you couldn't go that far to, to do the whole bit. So that's why the big change came in the, after the automobile came into being. Does that answer? Oh, that's a very interesting perspective. Thank you. Um, you were showing, at, uh, last time after uh, Dave left, you were showing me the window from the um, mm -hmm. Corn Church. Um, would you mind if we, if we brought that in? Yeah, you know where it is. 
And I don't, don't move very well, as you may have observed. This is such a lovely, um, lovely artifact here. You want me to hold it? Oh, I'll kind of hold I'm not in the picture here, am I? Wait a minute. I don't need to be in it. I don't know. Is that the right side or is the other? I never did know. I tried to clean it up, but I didn't want to mm -hmm. change the wood. Um, it was in, an inside window. Uh, the doors had, I think this had about six or seven. And in the process, they were stored out in the barn here uh, when they took the church down. And uh, we got three whole ones. I cut it, my son and, and uh, his friend worked on it <laughs> Christmas before Christmas, Christmas Eve day. Anyway, he did a, a big, <laughs> don't fall under it. It will probably hurt you much more than. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to break anything. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we, I gave one to, to Flora, Bob's sister, and what do I mean? I gave them <laughs> because they weren't mine to give, but, but he got three out, and one went here and one went to the Nortons. And um, I imagine Barbara Thames probably has it. She lives up near Hampshire, but, uh, and I imagine Flo uh, Dorothy took hers with her to Alabama. <laughs> so they're traveling around if, if they took them. I'm not altogether sure that, <laughs> that they would, maybe just a piece of junk, but uh, to the family they meant a lot. Um, when the church first got started, uh, Mr. Corrin donated the land and allowed the mm -hmm. neighbors to build the church. How, how did that work? I'm not sure. He had a, a list. I'm, I'm not sure even where that is. But I think the church cost something like $2,000. It was built in 1985, and it had no basement under it. What, what year was it built, Lucinda? I'm sorry. 18, <laughs> 1885 taken down in, um, I think it was 1927, either 27 or 29, I'm not sure which. Bob told me that I'd forgotten the story of my life. <laughs> What I find interesting about that is how it relates to um, the stories you've told me about the reason why Robert Corn left Virginia to begin with. Apparently he was a very religious man. And uh, wh why did um, old uh, senior Robert Corn, why did he leave Virginia? Well, it was a time for people moving out. and. If you've been in that part of the country, are you familiar with Greenbrier County or it? Um, what is? I'm trying to think of the name of the county, and I, I or the not the county, but they have this big hotel. I don't know what it's good for, but every president has stayed there. And they go there for treatments of some kind or another. Do you know what it is? Uh, it's something hot springs, uh, or it's a green. It sounds like it seemed to me dryer. it had something to do with salt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, I know where you're talking about. I don't remember the name. Uh, well, uh, that's better than I do. <laughs> I've actually stayed there. That's what I mean. So I know. I shouldn't remember. It wasn't called Greenbrier? Uh, no, yeah, it was called the Greenbrier Hotel. Oh. The, the Greenbrier. Okay. And it, uh, we were there 
we went looking for relatives, but we got a little confused because the name of of the relative went further than we we knew. Uh, but uh, it's kind of interesting when you, when you go in and look. I think I told you that we just got in touch with what would have been my grandfather's, my husband's grandfather. Um, half-sister who is descended from a first marriage. And the family we met um, and spent a little time with, we weren't there very long, but um, were Corns. And he was a, a workman in the Greenbrier Hotel. And I think it, his whole past had been in that. Now that's, you mentioned why did they come west? I think always looking for something better. Looking, and a 19-year-old uh, didn't have a much future there. I don't know if any of you remember, but I remember about, it seems 30 or 40 years ago, well, you wouldn't remember, but um, there was an attempt made to give the land away in Alaska. And not many farmers took him up on it. Well, if a farmer was settled here, the prospect of going to Alaska and leaving his home and all the things was what, what all these immigrants did from every country they came. They left families behind. In many cases, my my grandfather, Muirhead's twin brother, went to New Zealand. And so it, they were always moving and going on. And I think that was always ahead of them. Maybe it'll be better there. Like he looked at a house in Virginia and said, if I ever make it big, I'll make a house like, I'll build a house like that. I, I'm sure I told you that story. Cause that was one of the favorite stories of the family. But uh, I, I, I don't know any particular reason. Did he get along with his father? I have no idea. Okay. There may have been family problems, I don't know. But uh, so far as I, the big family, he might not have gotten along with some of his brothers. <laughs> it's pretty hard to tell. And he was the youngest. And so if there was anything to be gotten uh, in the way of help, he might be the last to get it. And so he just looked ahead. Well, his, his next oldest brother had gone to Niles, Michigan first, before he came here. And uh, it, it just seems like Nobody had very much, and they all had big families, and so they wanted the best for their families, and they moved on. It's a story of life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Wherever you go under any conditions, you're always looking to improve a lot of your family. At least that's what we, we always hope that you're going to do. Um, we have Thanksgiving coming on pretty soon, and I think you had mentioned that um, you have some uh, letter from Myron Amick uh, talking about President Lincoln uh, uh, commemorating the first Thanksgiving. No, I don't think it was the first. Wait a minute, maybe it was. I'm not sure which letter it's in. I've got quite a few obit obituaries of the family that... Uh... Now what is that you're holding, Lucinda? What do you have in your hands there? It's a book. Mm -hmm. uh, it's our family history. 
de la Is that something you wrote? Who, who, mm -hmm. wrote, who wrote the book? Yeah, I guess most of it's it's written by people. Let's see. These letters are all special. Just for example, I've waited so long and patiently for answers to my letters to Myron, that was my father-in-law. Uh, that I had quite despaired of ever hearing from any of you. Again, I wrote to Myron once from San Francisco and once from Honolulu, just after I got out of the hospital there. And I have sent papers from here a couple of times. So when I received a letter from you last, last, last week, I was surprised and pleased too. For even if you all seem to forget me, I can never forget you folks. Our chances for letter writing out here in the country are not what they used to be when we were quartered in barracks in uh, Manila. He, he, he was still in the army. Here we uh, used to be when we quartered in barracks. Wait a minute. Here we are living in little pup tents, just big enough for two to crawl into. We must carry everything with us when we move, for with our guns, belts, haversacks, I don't know what they are. canteen, blankets, and half a tent um, to carry, to say nothing of 200 round, rounds of ammunition and a shovel, axe, or pick to carry. If you can only bring yourself to imagine that, you can readily believe that outside of a few pieces of extra clothes, we have little room or strength either for anything unnecessary. Now that's the life of a, a soldier. I don't know too much about it. His, his life, but it was letters like that that kind of make me see a whole different side. I, uh, I like the book we have. It's The History of the 36th Regiment of Illinois Volunteers During the War of the Rebellion by L.G. Ben Bennett William Hey, I guess. Anyway, it was published in Aurora, Illinois by Knick Knickerbocker and Hedder, Printers and Binders, 1876. And I took different things out of that book. Uh, this was um, an article in, uh, from the book about Lookout Valley. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but in connection, I guess I had to get this. Lookout Mountain, I always thought, was in Tennessee. And some of his letters said Tennessee. But then he had an address, Lookout Mountain, or Lookout Valley, and it was in Alabama. So they were very close to the line. Um, now, where was I? What was I looking for to start with? Oh, you were talking about Thanksgiving. Well, this is part of it. I don't. I don't know if this is. It's written January nineteenth, eighteen sixty-three. I have lately received a letter from mother, and by it I learn that Addie has written to me, and have not gotten any answer. I have written, but I see that you have not received mine either. I have not heard from you for some time, but I am very anxious to hear. I suppose the reason why our letters did not reach their destination is owing to the inconsistency of the mails, which had been captured several times by the guerrilla Morgan. Uh, you know, Morgan's writers was who went through, especially through that that part of uh, that they were in, but. There weren't many of them, so they didn't stay long in one place, I guess. Anyway, so this clears up the mystery. I'm in hopes you get, may get this. I'm happy to inform you that through the goodness of God, I am alive and enjoying good health. 
hoping that these few lines will find you all enjoying the same blessing. I suppose you have heard of the Battle of Murfreesboro by this time. I was present during the whole engagement, which lasted five days. Uh, my pen is too weak to describe the sufferings which the battlefield presented. Just imagine that the effects of five days of hard fighting would amount to when every man struck with the determination to kill. Our brigade was stationed on the right wing, and he goes on to describe the battle of uh, Murfreesboro, which you may remember from history. If any, No, I guess they don't teach any battles anymore, do they? Anyway, now this is the part I think you were interested in. I received your long look. This was March 3rd, 19, 1863. I received your long looked for letter a few days ago. I was glad to hear from you all once more, to hear that you had been spared from the tortures of sickness. The soldiers in one of the regiments of this brigade have erected an arbor of cedar trees, which constitutes our meeting house. The seats are not so soft as those of the fine churches in the cities, but we are glad to have the privilege of even to stand up in order to hear the gospel preached. Today is Sunday, and the minister spoke plain and in an interesting manner. One cannot help looking with the greatest of interest upon a congregation of soldiers collected around their chaplain to hear the word of God and to hear them join in singing praises to God. Although it is unaccompanied by the sweet musical voice of a sister or some female friend, it is melodious to the ear. In accordance with the president's proclamation, that Thursday, the 30th of April, should be observed in the army as a day of fasting and prayer. Now that is the reference I think he referred to. We surely stand in need of the prayers of all good Christians. As the Holy Bible tells us that the prayers of the righteous availeth much. Then why should not every true Christian who feels for the interest of their country join in the supplications to the Redeemer of mankind that he will cease this wicked war and have peace and harmony and reign once more in our midst. Yes, underlined, the country, soldiers, and friends appeals to all Christians at home to use all their influence at the throne of grace for the cause that they are contending for. I could read the whole, whole thing. <laughs> I'm sure you'd find it interesting that you've read it before, so you know what I mean. That's lovely, Miss. Uh, but I, I think that's what you were yes, that asking was the, about. Yes, that was the reference I was thinking of. Yeah. I, uh, I, I'm always impressed. I was impressed with his, his writing. Missed some misspelled words, of course, and I didn't correct them. I put them in here as he, he had written them. At, at the time I did this, there was no such thing as um, the written word showing me his writing. Now when I think of all the things, I have a whole bunch of letters if you're ever interested in just reading them. I, they're copies. Uh, I'll be glad to let you take them. They're, uh, as I say, to me, very inspiring. They just, we take for granted so many things. And when you think of what these fellows went through in the war, and he, he describes it in pretty vivid detail. And all words are pretty much the same, I guess. But we do get much better coverage, I guess. But but there I had, I had forgotten the reference to Lincoln. But. Um, I was let's see something else I wanted to ask you was if you could um, talk to mm -hmm. us about some of the barns here on the farm. About what? The the barns, the outbuildings. Oh. Well. 
the first barn I think I mentioned is a part uh, that is, it wasn't the first one, I'm sure, because there were log cabins and there were, there was a log cabin. And there was, uh, in, uh, not in that picture, but in the other one, it shows the outbuildings. And I don't know anything about them. That is, most of the barns here were built in 19, around 1915. Uh, the, uh, if you know anything about, I can't tell you the names of them, but if you know anything about the structure of the barns where there's a, a straight roof, which was pretty common in the first, the first one, but then, then uh, when addition was put on in 1915, the other end of what we call the cow barn was had what I think they called it a hip roof or something. I have books on farms and I haven't read much about them. Can't even remember the names of the houses that I'm interested in. But um, that that was put on at about around the same time the horse barn was put on. The horse barn is the one that has our name on it. I imagine they'll be changing that pretty soon. <laughs> but uh, it, it was there as long as I've ever been around. So I guess Grandfather was <laughs> rather proud of it. Anyway, he, um, we had a, now the two I know that the, the corn crib was built in 19, the new modern corn crib. I think I told you in connection with that, somebody bought it from St. Charles. I think it was built in 1960. If you knew Frank Richman, which I'm sure you've heard of, uh, I think that was the last piece of, of uh, building that he really superintended. The um, chicken house, I'm sure, dates back to 1915, ready to fall down. And the, I suppose the pig house was, was built along in that same period. In the early days of the the 20th century, you would have most of those buildings going up. Now the Morton buildings, the big one was, I guess, the last area we could find, and they needed more room for tractors and so on. The more equipment you had, the more buildings you needed. And so that was built. Do you remember the year they, they had the big snowstorm that the roofs went in? I think it was 80, 88? Uh, I thought 79. 79? I think, I think you're right. The lat, they had just built the big barn just before that snowstorm, that is the big Morton building. And the uh, snowstorm brought in the roof of our hitherto, what we thought was a very fine building in good shape, was used for equipment, to keep equipment in. Um, and it had a slanting roof well, a snowstorm came, and Bob came in from milking, and he said, have you looked out the window? And I said, no. He said, the roof's in. So they spent days taking that up, and then they built the second Morton building. I, it was a year later, I think, than the other one. And that's a history of, of the barns. I mean, that's all I know about them. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure the boys could tell you a lot more. 
Only the thing that was distressing about that, for me, the tractor was new the year before, <laughs> and it hit the steering rod. And that, and also, we have a cutter. You know what a cutter is. Uh, snow. Anyway, I think the dashboard on that was destroyed. But otherwise, it didn't hurt the other machines that were in there. That was lucky. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes things are lucky. Yeah. Um, because the house here is so old, I, it was not built in the 1840s with modern plumbing. When, when were um, bathrooms added, and mm -hmm. how many and where? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't think I ever heard. A lot of things were done. Now, I think the hardwood floors here in the house were put in let's see the air floor was married. I'm not sure, but uh, it could have been in that particular time. Maybe about 1935 or something like that. And I think everything that could be modernized was modernized at that time. But I would think things like the bathroom had been done much before that. I, I'm just guessing because I don't know. The bathroom was originally a part of the, the um, that is downstairs, a part of the um, garage, what we call a garage now. But if you, if you look at the, the things, the bricks are raw. I mean, they aren't lying on, the, on this side. And on the inside, it's, um, I don't know what kind of wood it is, but it's just a thin wall that separates the garage from the rest, from the bathroom. Just the one bathroom in the house, Lucinda? Now we have two bathrooms. And where's the other one? The other one's upstairs. In the, it um, was used, as, I think Bob said he used this as a, as a bedroom when he was a boy. So. So they, com they converted the bedroom into a bath? Mm -hmm. Must be a pretty good sized bathroom, actually. Not really. No? It was a small bedroom. Oh, okay. <laughs> In fact, uh, upstairs we have our bedroom was like this, the same size as this. It has a fireplace in it. And off that, which was so common in those days, was a smaller bedroom. And my uh, daughter had that room when she was here. But she had to go through our room to get there. And those were the only two. In the hallway, there's, and I think they probably were there originally, closets. Of course, they've long since gotten rid of all the way. The hardware, or what do you call it? The hooks and things that were there. We have hooks still in this room here, which was one time used as a bedroom. There were quite a few people in the family at, at one time. So, and they're two smaller rooms to the, to the back, but they're, they're both small. Both have small beds in them. Narrow. Uh, One's an antique and the other's just a plain twin bed size. Um, 
I'm, I'm kind of curious about the garage or, or the carriage house. Well, there's, a, there's an outside entrance to it. That is, you go down a steps and you're into the basement. But at that time, the basement wasn't very big either. When you stop to think of the size of the house, the basement, the east room is still a crawl space, and that's still a crawl space uh, in the west room. So you can figure that the original basement was uh, that room would have been the, in it, but that's just a small room, sewing room. Bob tried for years to, to get a bathroom fixed in there, and everybody come in and look at it and shake their heads. <laughs> no way. So it's a room without a, ba a bathroom. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, a perfectly beautiful room because it has three bi three windows, which stop everything else, and of course enough furniture to worry about. So it's it's not easy to make it. On the other hand, I find the house. I can't ever complain about it. Um, you don't do anything without a step ladder. With windows that size, it's a big chore. But uh, otherwise, it, now like we have have a bathroom right outside the the kitchen, but we have a couple of steps. And when I broke my hip, that was a real chore to get down there. Now I've got all these rods and stuff that help me get around better, a little better. I can get around pretty well any place in the house without any problem. It's when I go out. I'm a nuisance. <laughs> I'm a nuisance anyway because I find I depend on people much more than I should. Oh, I think you're doing just fine, Lucinda. You're doing great. It's good you can move around like you can. Well, I'm thankful. Yeah. The Lord's been good to me. I had a, I had a wonderful husband and a wonderful family. And now since I found all these other members, I feel as though it's kind of enlarged. I just... My run regret is as Bobby and get to meet more of them. We did get to meet this this one Corin, uh, who would be a half something or other. Um, but he, uh, his ancestor, had made the the woods for golf, and they said uh, that in. Uh, they they thought that uh, Greenbrier County or Louisville, I'm not sure which, uh, the the hotel of the course is there. Now I didn't didn't get in the hotel. I don't know what it was like. Whether it was real old, but so many things are old in the east. That this probably what has was pretty well made and and uh, is is still standing. As I say, it's still a popular uh, place for vacations and things. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you a little more about the garage. Um, from things I've been reading in the history that you wrote, um, mm -hmm. things about the house, that there's a, a bake oven out there and that they used to use uh, part of it for um, uh, wood storage in the winter time. And then there's a little room for uh, collecting ashes for soap making. And then also uh, a portion of it was used for smoking meat. Is that? I have no idea. No? 
I don't remember even writing anything like that. Oh, you don't? Okay, well. But I know there was, there were, there were a couple little rooms, and we had paint in one of them, and they did bake once a week. I, I showed, showed you the, not the tins, the iron uh, pans. Uh, that they said they used to use out there, and there was some kind of an oven. But aside from that, I guess the thing I was most impressed with, maybe because Bob was the uh, um, license collection. He has everything from way back when. We used to go out when we had a day off. <laughs> I I usually went with him. And when we were living here, I didn't have to worry about it, at least at first, because Grandpa was always here. But uh, on the other hand, when we were in the first 10 years, I could just bundle the kids up and take them with me if they were little. And if not, I knew they were in school. So I was really freer, in a sense. And then when we moved in here, it was a little more difficult because we had a hired man. And uh, there were six beds in the wash every week. <laughs> so I was thankful for automatic washers and all the things. The first six months, I went back. I called it up home and did it. I was the only one that felt bad about moving, I guess. The kids were so used to Grandma and her doing everything, and they were a little bit like Bob, glad to get home. <laughs> so the moving was quite a thing. But we had a lot of time. I, Cal didn't move in until yeah, almost a year later. I think. Um, let's talk a little more um, specifically about the house, Lucinda. Um, do you know where on the property? They found the clay to make the bricks, and then how many bricks they made? Well, they had a kiln come in. And they uh, originally, I think, it, grandfather probably by this time was farmer enough to know that the slough back here, which has all the trees and stuff in it, was not the greatest thing in the world. Uh, for a farmer. So they went back there and tried to make bricks. And they ended up with these kind of, uh, oh, they're blah looking, kind of grayish, brownish. They aren't, they aren't a good red. And so they went back of the horse barn, no, the cow barn, out in the, in the east field. And uh, took the land from there. And there's something about bricks, I don't know enough about it, but that you have to have quite a bit of iron in the soil. Now, whether that was the reason that these are so much better colored. So what they did was, in the laying of the bricks, they laid, they took the, the bricks they had already made that they weren't too satisfied with. And they put them in the, you, I don't know if you noticed the size of the walls, the thickness, I think you can see. I don't, you can't see it from here. There, you can see that door. And that's, that's the thickness of the walls all the way through. So, uh, not all the way through, not in the kitchen. That's why I say, I think it was kind of like the old summer kitchen idea that you had this in introducing the people and they used it in the summer 
But in this case, it was well enough built, and of course it had brick on the outside. But we, it doesn't have the high ceilings, which I guess is a blessing. But we always had trouble with the ceilings. But I think it was because there was no roof over it. I mean, where you have the, another story. But see, that's kind of like this porch out here. But that's just the conclusion I've drawn from that, that, that it was kind of an added on thing. And as I say, the windows, the window, I should say, there's only one window there. Along with that, I probably should mention this. Uh, they were very devout Christians. And in uh, one of my Amy, Myron Amy's letters, I found this so very interesting. He had mentioned the fact that uh, Abraham Lincoln, during the war, this was while he was away fighting, and I'm sure he must have seen a lot, but they, he had mentioned the fact that Abraham Lincoln had declared a, a day of prayer, and he felt that all good Christians should be praying for the end of the war and so on. And also, he, uh, he remembered the old days in Campton when he, he sat in the church, he told how, this might have been in another letter, but he, he told how it meant so much to him to be in the church where they, where they worshipped. Uh, and if I, I think they called it the Old Stone School, but before the church was built, there, there's supposed to be, I think Dave said he, he showed somebody uh, the stones up in the woods where the church stood. And I suppose they spent like $2,000 or so for the church. Uh, I think he had a, I found a bill or something that had something to it. There was no basement under it. And there's a window in the dining room we took from the inside. I think it was kind of an inside doorway. And they had this six or seven panels. And Dave and his friend did some dividing up of the of the door and gave one one window to uh, Dexter and one to uh, Cal. See, Flora was, it was actually given to Flora, I guess. But we gave them, each one of them, so each one of us had a window. But they had been over in the old house and all kinds of things happened when you just put things away like that. And uh, what denomination? The, the windows come from the church? Was the uh, these, windows these windows did. And what denomination was the church? It was Methodist. And my father remembered coming here. He didn't, didn't remember the corns, I don't think, really. But that was when they'd take a, a buggy and and take them because there was a, a church in, uh, what are they called, East Burlington. But they called it the Hardin Church. Now what the Hardin Church stood for, I never did find out. But that was about five or six miles west of here, at least, on uh, the McDonald Road. I don't know that these roads were all named like that at that time, but they are now, so you could find it. And uh, that was what one church, and then the main church was in Plato, uh, Plato Center. But it was in the uh, old part of Plato Center, before the railroads went through. If you notice these back towns, most of them changed when the railroads went through. And Plato moved a half mile west 
Now I guess it's moved back to the... <laughs> everything's changed again. I suppose when you said, what, what have I seen changing? All the roads have changed so much. One of the interesting things about history, I find, is to see the direction the roads used to take. And, and now, you know, with Garfield Cemetery and all the trouble they're having about that. Well, when we used to go to my grandmother, we'd go down to Mungerson's, turn left, go about a six, sixteenth of a mile, I guess, and, and then go on Garfield Road, and then turn right and go back to where Beath Road comes in and follow Beath Road. Up. We only did that when the weather was pretty bad or something, but Christmas or sometime. And but, how long ago was that, that you would take that kind of a route? Well, I suppose I was a kid. I was a kid once, <laughs> quite a long time ago, but I, yeah. Uh, and was that by... I would think it was in the 1920s. We had a car when we took that way. When we had to go with a sleigh or something for Christmas, we would go down to the Burlington, to the, what is now Silver Glen, to Swanberg Road, you know where Swanberg Road is? And then we'd go back to Lily Lake, and that was, what, Canada Corners. I'm sure you've heard of all these things. And then we'd go back Hanson Road to Anderson Road. And my grandmother lived just a stone's throw or so from the house of the cupola. It's still there. A cousin of mine is living in it now. And, uh, but that was the route we took. That was the shortest route. I think. I'm not sure. But the, you followed the road wherever it went. But then somebody was just asking me about how roads were, and I just wonder if a lot of these roads didn't have curves in them and stuff because there were trees fell and they turned up and went around and you had a big departure from it. Now, I guess you have to use your imagination when you think of history and how it's repeating, because it never repeats exactly the same. And I'm sure our ancestors would have just collapsed to see the big network of roads that we have all over the country. But Could you talk about when electricity first came to this area? Who? Electricity, when they electrified. Oh, yeah. Well, I think we got ours in, I, I'm speaking from my own personal experience because I don't really know, of course I guess you could gather that by this time, but I don't really know when the corns got it. I think they got it a little later than we did, but it was in around 1930. And uh, in our case, we lived about, a mile and a half from the main road, off the main road. And I remember they were, my folks were quite shocked to think that they had to pay $11 a month for electricity. <laughs> uh, and uh, the, the neighbors who lived beyond us didn't have to pay that much when they got it a little later, but they didn't get it when we did. And actually, you had, was a part of the process of building the line. Now that may be just a Scotch story. <laughs> Everybody has stories, I guess. But uh, I remember that. And I remember Cal telling, 
about coming home from school and the house was all lit up. And when you, when you see what happens when the electricity goes off, we haven't had that problem of late because um, with the dairy, we've had a generator for quite a few years. But and we still have a little stove in the that we burn papers and stuff in. In the kitchen? Where is the stove? No, it's off the kitchen. Just across from the bathroom. It's, but uh, when we when we moved down here, I don't know if you met my mother, my nephew, when he came in. He said, <laughs> he told how. My sister had said, and he still got that old cook stove <laughs> in the kitchen. And it was a dirty thing because, you know, how the fireboxes would burn out. <laughs> I was always cleaning up after the, the firebox because it wasn't very good. But my mother was sick that year, and I used to get, put things in the, in the oven it would, they wouldn't burn. <laughs> They'd have all my do it. So I'd go up and, and clean her, her house up and uh, sort of hit or miss. But anyway, she, it was just one of those things that you lived with, but Grandpa loved it. He'd come out in the fall. He was, he was in his, yeah, he was 80, I think, when she, Grandma died. And so he, he just loved that old cook stove. And I can remember, I think he cried when they took it out. He went in his room. That room in there is a kind of a history room. With all the stuff in there. Now it's my room because I don't go up and downstairs. I don't go in any place very well. So when did you, you remodeled the kitchen here? If the kitchen had pretty much been original in its original state? Oh, no. I would say the kitchen. I Grandma had the window, the little window that's above the, the counter there. Uh, she had that in there. Now, I don't know why. But when we first moved, they had a lot of, of these antique cupboards. Most of them were out in the garage. <laughs> but we had two or three of those in the pantry. And, of uh, course, the bathroom was put on. That took part of the garage. And Bob's office, which now has a computer in it, uh, is a, a part of the garage. But uh, otherwise, any changes have been made. I remember a man... He was a friend of Bob's, came from Geneva, who was in Ivan something. He was from Europe, and he was admiring our old house. And he said, uh, but he said, and at that time we had uh, rugs that didn't cover the whole thing. And he said, but the first thing I do is to get rid of those hardwood floors. I said, over my dead body. <laughs> if you ever had to clean the the big wide boards. <laughs> but we have all hardwood floors, except in the kitchen where it's linoleum. But uh, otherwise, the house had all, all the wide boards. So under the carpeting here, it's still the wide plank floor? No, no, under the carpeting here is the hardwood. The hard, so it's the, the yeah, people tell me that we should not cover the hardwood, but they have not lived in a house with 12-foot ceilings and, and uh, a cold wind that blows in from the southwest. Our best room in the house. It, it's great in the summer. We have, I think you probably read it in the history, 40 doors and windows in the house. and uh, But that includes, like, that room in there has 
you really should look at it to appreciate it because it, it, it is a beautiful room. But it comes October, you're glad to shut the door. And that's the enclosed, the enclosed room you're talking about. I mean, this this room that we're sitting yeah. on. Yeah. If you want to step step up, just open the door. Oh, okay. You can look at it. You see what I mean, because. Oh my. Oh, I see what you mean. And it's great when you're entertaining, and I don't do much of it anymore, but. Used to do a lot of it. Um, and it, it makes it it makes the whole house look bigger and better if you can keep the door open, get it back, and and hide some of the work that the kids have done on the not just the kids, I guess all the adults. When you stop to think that. All the wood, the framework, but the they, you better set that. You'd be getting a draft on you. Thank you. You may have to. Our doors are well, a little to, iffy. You have to get the latch just right. That's uh -huh. the way it is with older doors, right? Definitely. <laughs> Everything's with, like older people. Everything kind of wears out. But, but I thought that would give you an idea of how much that meant to the house. But when we moved in here, uh, they had been, just been using it um, as a uh, bedroom. But in the summertime, that, that's fine. You've got all this air, the, as I say, all the doors, three doors in the room and five windows. And you get a nice southwest wind. <laughs> it's a great place to keep your candy when you're making it <laughs> in, in the winter time. But you hurry in and you hurry out. <laughs> um, how would you describe that room? Lucinda, was it originally meant as the yeah, fancy it is a part parlor of it. to the house? It was a part of the house. Well, you can see in the, in the pic, not in that picture, but in that one. Right. Oh, it's one But of you the... see, it has no, it has no basement under it, and it has no uh, uh, story under it. Our our house actually stops at this wall. So, the cold air does come in there. But do you suppose originally that was intended as like the fanciest parlor, the sitting parlor? In yeah, I'm sure. But I imagine they found out very early that with these cold winds, you had to shut it up. Uh, th that one on the east is the same thing, except that we've always used it, and then it has the kitchen over it. But now it was used in this sense. When when Grandpa Cora and I, I remember when I'd come here, um, Grandpa uh, always shut the door after him. And when we moved in, we had to explain to Dave, he was only four, that that was off limits. But Dave would get Grandpa's Montgomery Ward catalog or Sears Roebuck catalog. <laughs> Pick out his Christmas presents. <laughs> Grandpa helped him. <laughs> I don't think anybody ever got anything, <laughs> but uh, it was it was worth trying. <laughs> but the other the other two, Bob was nine. He had his ninth birthday in the basement here. Bob, oh that was the ping pong. Oh, if you're talking about how the ping pong room was a great room. When Bob was in high school, that's my husband. Uh, he and the hired man dug out under the basement and they took out what is a basis of our basement, really, these great big stones. And uh, back in the old days, we used to call them niggerheads. 
you've heard that expression, but well, now you don't do it. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, when we first moved up here, we took one room, and we had a furnace, uh, although Grandma Corn was still, what did they call it? You had a furnace, but you had to tend to it. Like a coal furnace or a, bo a boiler? A what? A, a boiler that you'd have to shovel the coal into? That kind of furnace? Uh, every so often, I think they had, I'm not sure. Oh, there was a name for it too, but I can't think of it. A, a stoker? A stoker. If that, if that was, I'm, I'm sure that was, and I don't, I don't know how it worked, but we had the furnace put in. See, we moved in in, in uh, September. Grandma died in July, and it took Grandpa the day six weeks to decide whether he could put up with three little kids. <laughs> and I know it couldn't have been easy, but uh, he had his own room. And it, it was a sanctuary. He could go in there and, and know that he wouldn't be interrupted, except on occasion when they would. But uh, the ping pong room was when the kids were growing up. Well, Bob liked ping pong, and then Cal came along, and Cal got really pretty good at ping pong. And so we did use the basement a lot. We aren't using it now. It's not in very good shape. The ping pong tables <laughs> have just disintegrated like everything else if you don't use them. So that's a part of the history I'd rather not repeat. <laughs> but, but it's what happens when things change too much. You were saying that um, when your husband was in high school, he helped dig out part of the basement? I think he was out of high school. Uh -huh. old. As I said, I think I told you that Cal was born when Bob was in high school. So I think he and the hired man dug it out. And they had these big, big stones that I was telling you about. And one's behind a door, and the other's near a little wall that's in there. But they, I, I used to say when we first moved up here, they, they were gonna spend the day moving stones. <laughs> we had a fellow who worked with uh, uh, cement work and that sort of thing. And he had, what do you call him, stone breaker of some kind that Bob went over and, and borrowed it and thought he could break up the stones, and it didn't work. They're just so big. And so it just, it, we moved it from room to room because the doors were too small to get, <laughs> get the darn stones through it. And it, it, was, it was a good uh, exercise, I guess. <laughs> they had nothing else they had to do at that moment. But uh, the ping pong room was added on. That was put under the kitchen. Under the kitchen. The kitchen was must have been kind of cold. I had had never really thought much about that. But uh, it it was uh, dug out for that. And it, so it was just, just big enough uh, for ping pong. You didn't have to chase the ball very far and <laughs> stuff like that. So I, I found, uh, I, I think that was a, a big part of the history of the house because we didn't spend... We used to have a lot of kids come in, church groups, and uh, come in. Now the kids come to see the old house. They don't get to the basement. <laughs> now why would you have the school children come over? I mean, because of the age of the house, or just to, to, to see a dairy barn when you were still doing dairy? Oh, when, when we have uh, kids come, they come like they do to the Norton farm, but we don't have that stuff. We had cows. We had cows. We have still have heifers. And uh, we have uh, chickens, yeah, a few, not many. But uh, otherwise, we really don't, aren't going to have anything. 
Well, would the would you invite the children to come into the house too? Oh yeah, I, I'd take them through downstairs. I'm like the White House. <laughs> My living quarters at that point were upstairs. I always stayed upstairs. Uh, now, and we don't have closets. And back in those days, you had one outfit if you were lucky, and that was it. But I've got clothes all over the place because uh, I'm trying to go from season to season. <laughs> Not that I have anything very, everything's old, but then it fits. Um, in the history that you wrote, you talk about how when Robert was initially building the house, he would only, he hired a carpenter to help him build it, uh -huh. and they would um, only, uh, he would only um, do it as much as, uh, I mean, he had an arrangement, some kind of financial arrangement with the carpenter. Could, could you explain that? Well, no, really, I can't explain it. They only said that he built, um, he always had hired men, and he, he had a lot of, our Swedish neighbors, who later became farm owners themselves, would come here. They wanted to get into a home where English was spoken. And we may not speak very good English, but <laughs> we at least spoke English. And, and uh, they were trying to learn the language. And so quite a few of our neighbors, I can think of, Abrahamsons and Andersons, different different ones who came, may have worked for him. Uh, they had a a uh, oh what do you call it? Where you hired people out in Geneva, and these Swedish people would come there, and uh, grandfather would get out and get enough to help. At at one point, he uh, he used. Uh, different things, different, uh, but he, as I say, I imagine there were parts of the year when he didn't need the help, and probably in the winter time, after all, you know, when you think of snow banks and stuff, and hauling things, and it, hit, it took quite a bit of doing. In fact, I marvel at the fact that he built this big house in four years. It, because uh, it is big. It has fourteen rooms, but there are a lot of them, like the den in here, and, and our different times have been used as bedrooms. But we really don't have that much sleeping space. And now that I've taken the only guest room we have, I. <laughs> You just don't want to invite people to stay overnight. <laughs> now, did they build everything all at once, or did, was the house built in stages? Well, I don't know. I have no way of knowing it, at, uh, unless I might be able to be something, be able to figure out something from some of the records we have. Now, I, it's very interesting. We have a list of of things that, what they cost in the 19, 1840s. And like, what, what amazed me was that they could buy uh, pork for four cents a pound. They didn't buy it by the pound. They bought it by the hundred. And the same way with beef. And chickens, maybe five, chickens for $10 or something. I mean, these, I'm, I'm just guessing because I, I, I have my figures here and I don't really remember exactly. But it, it's amazing how little things cost compared with the present day. Um, when, when Robert was working with the carpenter to build the house, uh, your history relates how he only would um, have the carpenter do as much work as he could pay him for, mm -hmm. and and then he would. Could could you talk about that a little bit? Well, that's all I know. That that uh, he would pay him and say, uh, 
when I get some more money, I'll call you back. And that's all I've ever heard. And I, a lot of it is, well, you know, you've worked enough, I'm sure, with, with the things. How much he gets yet? I'm sorry? I, I, it's how much you're able to guess about what happened. And I, unfortunately, when I had a gold mine with Grandma Corn, my kids were little and we were busy. And in school activities and church activities, we didn't have time to sit down and say, how was it in this day and age? So it was only things that she let drop once in a while. So when you're relating something like that about the carpenter, that was um, like a family story that uh -huh. uh, you heard from Grandma Corn when she, when she would talk Probably. Uh, Flora knew most of them, but Flora wasn't as good as Grandma about telling them. I remember how my nephews used to be, Bill's older brothers used to be so tickled to come over and see Grandma Corn because she had all these stories she'd tell and things to show them out in the, I think Jack knew about that. They had an oven out in the garage. And on the weekends, I suppose, uh, they uh, would uh, do their baking. Everybody did things by rhyme or reason, <laughs> where nobody does anything that way now. You turn on the wa washing machine and <laughs> everything else and go to bed. <laughs> I don't know. But it, it's uh, how, how would she use the bake oven? Not too many houses have, you know, even the older houses, if they've been remodeled, they don't have their original bake ovens. Is that still in the wall? Uh, no, I think it's been... I think it became the paint room. It's part of it, it's still in the house, but because it's all gray out there, probably covered with license plates. Because <laughs> <laughs> Bob had quite a collection. Uh -huh. um, and from what I understand, is that is that part of what had been the carriage shed, the north end of the house? The what? Mm -hmm. It, where the bake oven is, is that where the carriage shed is? Yes, uh huh. And we have an outside entrance to the basement that uh, where they kept coal and stuff. Um, Probably wood in in the earlier days. Um, how many fireplaces are there in the house, Lucinda? Well, there's one here, which has the furnace in it now. And they all, I think they all have them. The door, so you could shut them up. There's one in there. And there's one in the east room. And one upstairs, so there'd be four. And the one upstairs is in line with this, mm -hmm. with this one? Yes. I've never, I've never personally seen doors like that on them. I think that's very interesting. It just, I mean, I've seen fireplace screens, but I've never seen doors on fireplaces like that. Before. Well, I imagine they had quite a bit of wood. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they probably, I think most of the wood is pine. But I have found that this graining is something that is pretty hard to get off. You read the directions and it says put it on and take it off in 15 minutes. They don't say how many times you do that, but it's probably 50. <laughs> I've done that. I did the, you might be able to see in the, I don't think it's, it's probably dusty now, but you uh, see the 
fireplace, the top of it is done. Oh, and I think the, I did most of the one upstairs. You the mantle? Can you read what's written there? There's a, I see a shadow of something. I can't, what does it say? Welcome. Welcome. Home. Welcome home. I think somebody in the process thought it would be nice. And probably somebody else <laughs> didn't like it. But I think it must have all been done in, at about the same period of time that they covered it up. But it's always a good thing to show the kids when they come. They find things like that interesting. I have a uh, an old cheese box. You know what the cheese box is like. It looks like a hat box. And I have one of those. Uh, Dave had to have something for show and tell when he was second or third grade. And I said, well, we'll go up in the attic and see what we can find. And we found this cheese box, and it was great. He could put his lunch in it, his books, carry it all to school. <laughs> and I don't know if he knew what he was taking <laughs> when he got there. But now I kept it down here. And uh, I have a lot of little things in it. To, when kids come, I show them to them. Kids that, who didn't grow up in Laura Ingalls' time don't remember. <laughs> we have a little cemetery up here on the road where one of the Ingalls' children was buried. They were here in Campton Township. Well, Jerry found a record of it. I think he probably told you that they have a... I think the one in Campton, there were two brothers, and I think the one in Campton lived somewhere in the Burlington. And the uh, other one lived up, apparently up the road here somewhere because Grandpa knew the family that had there were four graves, four children. But it's on a private home now. I wonder how they get away with that. Uh, they fenced it off, and it looks real cute and attractive. But they say they don't let people in. And I think that's unfortunate. Because kids, especially at that age who are reading Laura Ingalls, uh, it means something to them. I think it's very nice that they're continuing to maintain the grave site and the... the well, I don't know that that is true. See, the road is changed. When they put the black top in, they changed the road. And there's a kind of a high bank. And some of the workmen who were there kind of wondered if, or, or some, some of the neighbors probably, wondered if the workmen came across these stones and they were in the right of way or something and they threw them up there because they were they were uh, like this uh, kind of facing each other you know you expect to see them in a row and they weren't uh, when we saw them I don't know how they're fixed now but uh, when we saw them they weren't of course, all these old cemeteries have pretty much gone the way of livestock or, or people taking the slabs for stepping stones in their garden <laughs> and stuff. And they did take one of those. Um, where, where, are the corn, where is the corn family buried? Uh, the corns are all buried in the Burlington Cemetery. And about where is that, Lucinda? Uh, it's, um, well, you know where the schoolhouse is. It's a little bit west of the schoolhouse, across from the, not, not across. I think it's still a little bit west of the, yeah, the house of the cupola. See, the, that was the first white man to come into Campton Township. And Grandfather Corn was the second. I think the others were all on their way to the lead mines up <laughs> in. Uh, Around Galena? Yeah.
Galena, that territory. Yeah. See, the, the Burlington is one of the really old roads. Of course, it has a lot of quirks and turns in it that they didn't have. But it went uh, from St. Charles to Burlington to Genoa. There's a black top from Genoa. And then it meets up with uh, 20 at Belvedere. And then, of course, the Elgin Road had 20, and they met up there. Then you had the road that the Garfield Road, I suppose, is a, a reflection pretty much of 38. Well, the St. Charles Chicago Road, and it was the configuration of that was sort of parallel Route 38, but was a little mm -hmm. different. K kind of following Campton Hills Road, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the early maps, uh, it almost kind of amused me, but uh, in looking at the early maps, you see where Anders, not, Campton Hills Road went straight through to where uh, 47. And there's a little chunk, chunk of land in there. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about the Stewart family. Well, I think the Stewarts own practically everything in sight. <laughs> and I, I think maybe they didn't like that, and they, they closed up the road. I, I don't know if that was the, the story, but it looks like it. That's what I've heard from Martin and, and Jerry, that at some point the Stewart family closed that portion of the road from, from Anderson Road over to Route 47. So Campton Hills Road doesn't go through that part anymore. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, it, it always, from the, when I was a kid, it, so it's a long time, uh, it uh, seems like there was a little jog in the road. I'm not sure about that. When we went, see, we would take uh, Anderson Road to Grandma's. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't know why that jog was there. <laughs> now, do you now, get me thinking? Now where did your grandmother live, Lucinda? Well, she, lives in the, she lived in the Beef House. Oh, she lived in the Beef House? Oh, well, she was it, born in the Beef House. Oh. No, she was born in the old Beef House. Uh-huh. Not the... Uh, that's something else. I, I was always going to ask Jerry if he knew anything about it. But the... Uh, Atlas of 1870, I'm not sure if it's, because one place it says 1873, and another place it says 1872, and another place it says 1874. Well, my grandmother, or my mother, was born in the old house, and the beef house is shown in that atlas. She was born in 1873. And uh, my aunt was born in 1875, and she was still born in the old house. But when you look at the atlas and see that picture of the beef house, it, uh, it doesn't ring true because uh, the beef house had, has uh, all this... Uh, Oh, nursery type thing. I think it has a big heart <laughs> out in front, something like that. The heart driveway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that they didn't have all that. <laughs> but how did they get that picture? And then they have 1872 and 1873. And I know it wasn't built till just before 1877, I think. I would. Yes, that might have been 1876 because that name was born in 1875. But Bob Beast, I don't know if you knew Bob. I'm not sure I've met Bob. I, I've 
Mad Betty beef. Well, you know? Bob, this is Bob now. This is, he's, what, second cousin or something. But Bob Beef was my cousin. Okay. And he had a radio shop when they were very popular in uh, St. Charles. And uh, he, uh, his father was my mother's brother. And Uncle Rob and uh, my mother and Aunt Mae were all born in the, in what they called the old house. And uh, I don't think you can see it now because I think Aunt Rachel kind of let it go. But there was a, it was kind of a depression out in the front yard when you mowed the lawn. You could see where our building had stood. And I asked Aunt Jo, Bob's mother, uh, about this because I thought it didn't sound right. And, uh, but <laughs> it's hard to ar argue with printed <laughs> material. <laughs> Well, it, it is, uh, in the atlases, they are all um, artistic renderings, you know, so uh, maybe they took some poetic license or if the house was already under construction. But I, what I figured was that they did these pictures especially, but putting together a history, they may have... have uh, taken some liberties in the uh, uh, in getting it out I'm gonna we're gonna have it out by 73 and it didn't come out then apparently but they had to get money to finish it so I think it probably took for, for, for three or four years to do it because it didn't, didn't seem right any other way but um, it, for the simple reason, when we were uh, when we were first married, and I think it was after we moved down here, uh, some fella came around and he wanted to to uh, do a history, and Bob was always a great sucker for everything, but he wanted to deposit because you know he was trying to put this together, and Bob gave him twenty dollars, and I think that's what he was asking for everybody, if you wanted to be in it. And uh, if you probably if you'd had your picture and you'd had more, it would cost more. But if they do it by subscription like that, uh, they maybe succeed. This fellow didn't. He came back about two years later and said, I couldn't get enough. And he gave Bob his $20 back. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> At least he came out ahead on that. <laughs> but... Uh, that that's the only way I can explain it. That uh, it was probably a matter of publication, because that that book turned out to be a a very special thing. Of course, mine isn't. It's it was Grandpa Beast. And it's in rags. <laughs> it's pretty, I made copies of most of the maps, so especially the north part of the town county. But uh, it just had fallen apart. Oh, had he, had he, uh, Grandpa uh, written some kind of history or? Well, Grandpa, uh, this was interesting. Was this uh, my, my grandfather, Beef, had this old one, 1872. Grandpa couldn't have been too old then. But anyway, probably his father bought it. But anyway, he, he had this, this old copy. But Grandpa Corn didn't have that. They probably didn't have money to invest in it. But he had a, we have what is in pretty good condition, an atlas from 1890. And that kind of takes care of the back towns. You see, like Plato changed direction between those years, between 1870s. And I was just fortunate to, to have the beasts one as long as I did because it, it you know how 
old things yet deteriorate, and you can't do much about it. I know Bob, Bob worked at Gail Borden Library for a while, and he said, he asked him about it. There really wasn't much they could do. The, uh, eight, these atlases then, like the 1873 atlas, they also had maps in them? Oh yeah, they had big maps. I've got copies of them. But I've got the original. I haven't the heart to throw all those sheets away. <laughs> Somebody will throw them away someday. Well, they're, Pretty soon. I, they're very valuable to hang on to. And if you were of a mind to want to include that with the paper documents for the house or whatever, I and I don't know what you've been talking to with the township in that regard, Lucinda, but but please don't you throw it out because the I know I, I I go through these things and think I must throw that away. Okay. Maybe somebody will want it, especially when I see all these old letters that I found and found them so interesting. But on the other hand, uh, you can't keep them forever. What kinds of old letters do you have? You, you talked about the letters from Aunt Addie and then from Myron. A Amy, mm -hmm. is it, from the Civil War? I have Civil War letters, about half a dozen of them. I found them in various places in a trunk. Um, and there might be more, I don't know, but I've never run across them. But I've never taken everything out of <laughs> uh, Our attic is, well, yeah, we never could buy any new furniture because our attic was too full. <laughs> we didn't have any place to put the old ones, and you didn't throw it away. <laughs> well, it's a good thing that you saved all the uh, artifacts and the, the historic treasures that you have. That's a very special thing. Well, I thought the family deserved that. After all, Grandpa and Grandma did everything they could for their family, and I, it would break their hearts to see the farm go. It, they, I couldn't believe it. I can't remember their ever celebrating their wedding anniversary. I can't remember the Christmas they celebrated, yes. But they always celebrated October 16th, the day he arrived here. And so you can see how important it was to him. Oh, his birthday was. They got a dish up in the cupboard that they wore a hole in with. Uh, they put what looked like mashed potatoes, but it was cotton in. I can't believe they did it every year because he sure couldn't have fooled people that long. But his birthday was on the 1st of April. <laughs> Stories like that fascinate me. So the family used to put cotton in this bowl? <laughs> well, on, that's on the April story. Cotton. They probably did it once. <laughs> it made a family story. <laughs> to celebrate April Fool's Day, on his birthday, right? <laughs> yeah, on his birthday. Yeah. So they must have celebrated it once. I don't know if they ever celebrated it again, but his birthday was on April 1st. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a funny one. I, I tell you, you have to take it off a lot of history with uh, a sense of humor. Yeah. <laughs> my, my, on April 1st, my dad used to like to... Um, wake us up saying that when we were little, saying that there was snow outside. So, you know, we, we were going to have to walk to school in snow, uh -huh. and here it was already spring. And half the time, there wasn't any snow Where outside. Where did you grow up? In Chicago, on the northwest side of Chicago. <laughs> in a little bungalow that my grandfather had built in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. So we were living there in the 1950s. My grandmother came as a bride from... Scotland, and she, uh, they came, this is what I meant about families coming together. They thought they had a relative living in Virginia. And I used to tell my dad, well, they knew you were coming. <laughs> so they moved, they never found anybody. So they got out a map, and this, this was in 1849, and they looked at the map, and 
and uh, ha, Dundee, that's a good Scottish town. <laughs> so they, every time they'd go out, uh, uh, they'd see a wagon going by in Chicago, he'd say, uh, or she'd say, George, you run out and see if he's from uh, Dundee. And they found somebody from Dundee. They went out and stayed with them for a week or two, and they helped them buy a little farm out there. My grandfather didn't know anything about farming, but and I was like the story they tell about Britain's Hill. Well, Britain's Hill is just this side of Elton. He'd gone to town with a team, and he didn't know much about harnessing teams and stuff. And they, he said, uh, um, he got stuck. This this is a hill just before you go into Elgin. And he said, uh, he got stuck out there. And a neighbor came along and he said, tough luck in your head, and drove on. <laughs> now that's the story they tell. I can't believe that any pioneer ever did that to another one. <laughs> It, it made a good story. It was much better than if he'd stopped and helped him. <laughs> I'm boring you with all these other details that have absolutely nothing to do with. But I don't have a paper in front of me. <laughs> if, if I could keep a straight line, I would. <laughs> Oh, could you tell us about the uh, the house next door, the, right out here? Well, I don't know too much about it. Uh, it was built in 1885, I think the same year the church was. And it uh, was built for a hired man. And the story that I always heard and I'm sure it probably was true uh, that Grand